to be here uh, to uh, talk about um, a subject which I'm quite passionate about, uh, competing and collaborating in China with bicultural competence. Uh, it's especially meaningful for me to be in the Silicon Valley with Google today talking about this particular topic because uh, this is my first visit to your campus. As I walked in, I see a global village at work. I see a global village with people full of idealism and passion and a deep belief in building a, a common world uh, for humanities. Uh, but we are deeply divided today as human beings. We are deeply divided today and uh, partly because of the fact that the, the East-West culture is diametrically opposed and it's, it's polarized and, um, and we don't know how to reconcile them. Um, I did not learn about uh, uh, bicultural competence or we call it sometimes transcultural competence until I studied at Cambridge for my doctoral uh, program with Dr. Charles Hampton Turner, I call him my beloved teacher, a Cambridge uh, scholar and a Harvard PhD. And he and his, his consulting firm, uh, 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 Tompanos Hampton Turner in Amsterdam, uh, they both uh, did a lot of work in the areas of uh, Dalima theory and cross-cultural competence. And much of the work, much of the presentation I make today is a lot of Charles' work. And I use the Dalima theory, which is cross-cultural competence, to do a new product development uh, research work in my, in, my, in my field of research. I'm currently a uh, professor of, of technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation at the Nanyang Technological University, and I live in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> um, I was wondering, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what do you see in this picture? Let's, let's just spend uh, 15, 20 seconds to look at the picture. What do you see? Wow, <laughs> bats and angels. Okay, well, what else do you, others see? What do you see, sir? Yeah, I see the same. Bats and, bats. bats and angels, what do you see? Yeah, kind of like a fractalish structure that's branching off. Okay, and man, what do you see? Uh, bats. Bats, okay. Could you see the angels? Yeah. All right, okay. So does anybody not see both bats and angels? Okay, does anybody see anything else besides bat, bats and angels? A plate, that's the holistic view, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the composition of the bats and angel in a very nice display, right? So the display is actually alternately, right? A bat and an angel, a bat and an angel. So I think that uh, one, of the, one of the problems about culture is that, that we tend to see each other the way we like to. Sometimes we see, see ourselves as the angel and the righteous angel, and the people of the other culture of the other camps are, are the bad. So, and we want to make this whole world either all angels. If this, if this picture was recomposed to be all angels, then the question is, what would it be, look like? If it's all angel, what would it look like? Exactly, there would be no picture. What if it's all bad? There'll be a black ball. So I think there's a philosophy. There's a deep philosophy in this very simple picture. There's a Dutch uh, painter who painted this. Uh, that it, it resembles the two polarized culture of the East and the West. And it is when the East and the West, the values come together and synthesize and reconcile in a systematic way. It is when we do that, where we then have a, a very beautiful picture and a, and, a, and a very good world to live in. <laughs> and, and a lot of the things that, that I've read about Google's is very idealistic. And much of it is also the synthesis of these two values. But let us, let us look at 
Um, what, is, what are the major differences between the east and the west? Uh, if you look at the left hand side, I think that uh, in the west we tend to be more universalistic. Uh, this is where we invent laws, we invent standardization, this is where we want to unify everything by rules and produce everything the same way and consume a hamburger the same way. We want to do that across the world. <clears throat> That's just a cultural orientation that we tend to be more inclined to, to do that. But in the East, people are polarized. These are the cultural values. They are more particularistic. Uh, you know, we were going to be talking a little bit about China. And we find that the Chinese people have difficulty in obeying the laws. Why? Because they are, their culture is more particularistic. Particularistic is exceptions. They always like to deal with the exceptions. Okay, this is the law, this is the rule, but it doesn't apply to me. We have a local situation which, is, which deserves some exception, exceptions. So, but if these two cultures and these two values were polarized, we insist on one way, and everybody has to behave that in that standard way. And another culture says that, no, it doesn't apply to me. I can always be, uh, there will always be an exception. You know, we don't have to go by the intellectual property law signed by the whatever convention. Uh, then, then these two worlds will always be polarized and it creates a lot of conflict between us. The West is, 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 we are more individualistic here in America and in the West, especially in English-speaking Anglo-Saxon culture. And the East is very much more of a communitarian. And that is why when people do business in China, they run all kinds of problems. Why? Because the Chinese government want you to transfer technology, want you to teach them how to do different things before they start doing a lot of business with you. Coca-Cola, for example, had to build a, a bottling factory Right? Coca-Cola supplies concentrate and they have to build bottling factories and literally give it to the Chinese and say this is how you do a modern age bottling factory for Coke, for beverages. And then the Chinese say, oh, this is how you do it. Okay, this is world standard. This is the state of the art. But in exchange, the Chinese government grant Coca-Cola all kinds of privilege all kinds of license to be the first in China over Pepsi Cola. Over Pepsi Cola. Why is it that Volkswagen is, is ahead of everybody else's in China? Again, it's because they understand that the Chinese culture is a communitarian culture. There are certain things that the Chinese value more so than, than, than the West. Is what do you do for us as a community? And in the East, in the West, we are more specific. Newtonian science, we are more specific. We take things, we take a lot of things and we try to break them down into pieces or break them down into categories, like you do here, right? So that your search will be much easier and much faster. And then we try to reduce down, them down to the very small unit and we try to find relationships. So we converge. We, are, we come from a culture of specific, specificity. And in the Orient, People are always very diffuse. You do business in China or in, in, in Japan, you ask them a specific question, whether we could do it or not, and the answer is, hi, hi, okay, okay, but it doesn't mean that we can. It means that I'll think about it. But you know what? It is not that they are dumb. It's not that they're stupid. They could be a graduate from Tsinghua University, Beijing University, which is the top 0.01% of the talent, but they'll still tell you the same thing. But culturally, they don't want to converge so quickly, all right? Because they come from a very diffuse culture. Just look at the painting, for Christ's sake. Look at paintings in the West. We paint in the West pictures, portraits, as close to the real person as possible. But in the East, you look at the painting, it's always very diffuse, you know? Landscaping and whatnot, and, 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 the, and the painter will, Finally, before he finishes the painting, spray something and make it really, really foggy. The whole scene is so foggy. Foggy. And the monk is up on top of the hill, meditating, and he forgot to come down. 
It's always so abstract, always so diffuse, always so foggy, always so lack of specific details. Whereas in the Western painting, we painted the mole and the eyelashes and everything in detail. But these are our cultural orientations. And they do lead to the way we strategize. Our strategy in business is affected by the way we think and our cultural values. The next thing is that we are more interdirected. I think it's because of the Judeo-Christian culture. We are, we and our God, we are more interdirected in the way we think about values. And in the West, they are more auto-directed. The first thing to think about is, if I did this, what is going to happen to the society? What's going to happen to the societal environment at large? Because it is a communitarian society, and harmony, and, and don't rock the boat, and peace is, is the highest sense of value for them. Here in America and, and in the West, we write to the presidents and we tell the presidents that we are angry with the war. We are angry with his policy, right? Because we come from a society where status has to be achieved. Prove it to me. Prove it to me that this is right. You, don't, you have to earn. This is a hard-earned thing. You've got to earn it. If not, you're going to lose my votes four years from now. But in the East, that is not the values. If you have been elected as the president of a, of a country or you are the emperor or you are, you know, whatever, the prime minister, people ascribe the status to you and you, you are accorded the fullest respect and the fullest cooperation. And with that stature and the status come a lot of convenience that people will award to you. You don't have to prove yourself because by virtue of that stature and the status, you are being worshipped. It's just a cultural difference. And we're not saying that which is right or wrong. So we have a problem here. We have a, a, a business people going from San Francisco, going to Shanghai. He thinks about time as a sequence. I have one week in Shanghai. This is what I'm going to do the first day. Second day, you know, I get off the plane. I'm going to go to the company. I'm going to visit the client. I'm going to visit the supply chain. I'm going to go look at the stores. The fourth day, I'm going to talk about details on the contract. The fifth day, I won my order. <laughs> because the sixth day, I'm going to get on the plane, come back to San Francisco. So we think about time linearly as a sequence. But then in the West, in the East, people think about synchronized time. We're not going to do business until your timing, and my timing, and the timing of the earth, and the timing of God, the heaven, comes together. Time is a circle. It's a synchronized time, like just JIT. It is not your calendar month. It is not your linear thinking about timing, my friend. That's why we get so frustrated. These two cultures clash. These two cultures come together, and they are more even, they're even more polarized, and they are tension, and they create all kinds of dilemma for us as business managers. So these are the six cultural dilemmas, cultural uh, dimensions. But you know what? As much as they are polarized and they're different, if you flip it over, they're truly mirror image of one another. It, just, it is just like saying that um, uh, when you look at the, you scan your book from left to right, or you scan it from right to left. It's just a different way of doing it. You can't say that which way is right and which way is wrong because it's just a different way of doing it. They are just different. So these values are just different. They are differences. It is like saying that uh, in the East, we, in the West, we like to say that uh, what we want to do is to benefit ourselves first and the society will benefit uh, at large because each of us satisfy our own needs and each of us take care of our own interests. But in a different culture, especially in the East, they like to say that, no, we're going to look at, because we're communitarian, we have to do things that benefit the society first, and if the society progresses, then we as individuals will do well. But what is the difference? It's like saying that, you know, look at this. For the world to function well, we need both. We need both to come together nicely. If not, we'll have a dilemma. If we always see, you know, if we always see a certain culture as the black bat and we are the angel, this world will be in trouble. 
or, or if they always see us as the black bag and they are the angel, we, we have a problem. We have a dilemma. So, if we see it that way, we're always going to have, if we're polarized and there's this tension, it's like a straight line, you've got two values, and we pull it, and there's tension in the middle. We're always talking about, you win, I lose. You know? So these are the six different, how do we reconcile that? Let's take a look at the various cultures. If you look at this uh, slide here on the left hand side, you have this eggs. Right? They are all the same. <laughs> this is very much how we think in the West, universalism. And you have on the right, uh, Fabergé, a French uh, uh, egg that, that is nicely crafted for the, for the, for the emperor. That is just one, one only, one and the only one. Everyone is different. So one is more particularistic and one is more individualistic. Now, um, I, I'm sure you know, here in, in, in uh, San Francisco is very uh, multicultural. You, you go to Western restaurant, you go to Oriental restaurants, you find a major difference. If you go to the Western restaurant, the waiter comes along and says, what would you like to have today? And the menu is about, dinner menu is about that thin. You can have fish today, you can have seafood, you can have chicken, or we have very nice lamb chops. And it's, it's just one thing and it's done and it's universalistic. But if you go to, your, to a Chinese restaurant, for example, you order a fish, chicken, <laughs> vegetables, and maybe a soup dish, you have a variety of things. They cater for you. Tell me what you want. You can have a uh, a dish of every different thing. You, you don't have to eat fish, just fish today. So that itself tells you that we are actually quite different the way we think. All right? Now, um, and, and, and our strategy uh, affects, this, this is a, uh, affects the way we think. This is the question that we ask in order to classify people into these two cultures. We ask this question about universalism and particularism, and I'll show you the results a bit later. <laughs> we say that there's a st we tell people the story that you and a very good buddy friend of yours went for a night out, hang out at the bar, and you drank. Both of you drank, and you came back, and your friend was driving. The weather was a bit, you know, foggy out there, and he had a bit too much to drink. He was going a bit faster than he should. Bang! He hit a pedestrian. The pedestrian died. So you are the only eyewitness. And you have to testify in court. If you testify the truth in court, your very good buddy friend is going to go to jail for many years. And he has two kids, young kids at home. And you know the family very, very well. So are you going to, does your friend have the right to expect you to tell the truth, to testify the truth? You know, that's the question we ask. Or does your friend have the right to have you protect him because of the friendship. That's a tough question, you know. So think about that question. I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But think about that question. And we asked this question to a bunch of executives in the East. And they gave us different answers. Let's look at the answers. These are numbers. In, in the West Switzerland, English speaking, New Zealand, Australia, US, Scandinavia, and UK. The majority of people say that the friends don't have the right to expect them to testify in order to protect, to tell lies, to lie to the court in order to protect, them, to, to, to protect him. Whereas many countries in the East said that, sure, as good friends, the pedestrian is already dead. All right? You didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, you went perhaps a bit too fast, but you didn't do it intentionally. You got two kids. You know, I'm obligated to protect you because we're long-time friends for 25 years. So that's, that's the answer. And I just did another survey about four weeks ago with a bunch of executives from all across the world, from a, com a French company called Eliquid. It's an 11 billion euro dollar company, Eliquid. I got 35 students in my class, they're all general managers, and I asked this question. You know, the French people are very communitarian. They're much among the Anglo people, the French people are culturally most aligned with the East. And that's the reason why we fight all the time 
that we have problems, right, on international issues with the French people. They are always taking opposing sides. It's not that they want to antagonize the United States, but because of their six-dimensional cultural values, they're quite different from, from the Anglo-speaking people. Truly, if you look at all this, this data. So it's interesting that we come from both different sites, different aspects. So this is particularism and, 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, universalism, a display of, of particularism and universalism. These people expect, the English speaking, the, the Nordic people expect us to have a unified way of looking, treating law. But what is interesting though, is if we change the relationship, we say that it was your brother who was driving the car, then the answers begin to change even in the West. Because that relationship is much closer. People begin to waver a little bit. Say, oh, my brother, I don't want him to go to jail. <laughs> okay. Now, from a business standpoint, you can take these two values one is a universalistic value where standardization, law, rule of law, mass production, everything is the same. And you can actually, and this is, if you look at the Dell model, Dell produce components ordered en masse, and they give you a customization program where you are empowered to select whatever you want to, to give you a solution. So, so this customization, customer's choices, is a particularistic mentality. This is the, more of the Eastern type value, right? But what do you want? You choose, you go, you design your own model, you design your own computer. But here, they have a lot of modularized components among what you choose. They are produced at very high speed, at very low cost. And they have a standard modular platform. So, so when you begin to look at this, this mass customization model, which Dell uses IT to support it, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, is really the synthesis of the two values. So, so what we're trying to say is that there's a dilemma for companies to be totally low cost oriented, high volume, and want to, to customize. Customize, and customization is very expensive. So these two, why do we think that way? Why do we tend to think that way? Most of the companies in the Orient tend to do a much better job in customization, but not high volume customization, low volume customization. And then in the West, we are very good in mass production. But now, the winning formula is not that. It's high speed mass customization. So now we're joining the two values, which is intention in Dalima, from a straight, the two ends, the, end, the two ends of a straight line, we're putting them into a circle and we're spinning them in a spiral so that every, every computer that you receive from Dell is a synthesis, a reconciliation of mass customization. Customization, which is what you ordered, you design it, plus the components are produced at high speed. So, so that itself is a cross-cultural competence. So it's the way you join the values of these two extreme cultures. Toyota does the same thing with Lexus. So we're turning this culture of competence into a strategy. Toyota has uses the basic chassis, and on top of that basic chassis, which is to produce in millions, they mount all these special customized parts, more luxury parts of comp for dashboards and whatnot, for the Lexus model, to give you this customized superstructure on common platform. This is how. Toyota builds its Lexus car, which is much cheaper and much low cost compared to Mercedes-Benz right? and BMW. But again, this is a perfect example of using the East-West uh, bicultural competence to craft strategy. It has both the Western value of Standardization and mass production and, unific and, and, and um, unification and, and, and also the Eastern value of customization. Now, the other dimension is, is individualism versus communitarianism. And <laughs> if you look at most of the economists, uh, in America in particular, 
and certainly the UK uh, in, in, in the 18th, 19th century, which is a pioneer capitalism where a lot of inventions, a lot of enterprise were built right now in this Silicon Valley. We are more uh, individualistic and therefore we involve ourselves in deeply in, in innovation. Like what, I can smell innovation and creativity as I walk into this kind of beautiful campus of yours. And that's culturally, we, we have a culture of pioneer capitalism. Whereas in the East, because it's more communitarian, and they're involved in catching up, copying, fast correction, fast copy, just to catch up with the West. They're more comfortable doing that because of the cultural orientation, because they're more communitarian. This way is lower risk, much less risky, right? More to emulate, but it is more communitarian because the communitarian society talks about harmony in general. Harmony is very important, not no huge disruption. When you want to change, there must be continuities. And that's the reason why China did not dismantle its political system when it switched from a planned economy to a market-driven economy, whereas the Soviet Union dis given up everything so there was no continuity and it disintegrate. This is another survey that we do. We, we ask the, uh, the question about the importance of individual freedom and again uh, the English speaking Anglo countries and Israel also rank very high and again even Singapore you know, ranks quite low in this research. Now France, look at France again, <laughs> interestingly, among, <laughs> is in the same category as, as the East. So they're much more communitarian than we think. Uh, such approach could be translated into strategy. Um, IBM, for example, uh, has a strategy of rewarding the people. Instead of forcing people to compete, uh, the more individu individualistic way, uh, there is this cooperation. But too much of cooperation can become colluding. <laughs> you can collude, you know, rather than cooperate. And also, but this was the internal competition that they did some time ago by rewarding people. So, okay, um, who, who, whoever turns in the most sales of the month uh, is rewarded with a big bonus. So people go out and close sales and window address the sales and try to get the numbers in as much as possible, and they don't, co they don't collaborate. That is one extreme of individualism. But if you cooperate too much only, without much of a competition, then you tend to collude. So they came up with a, with a, with a method of measuring uh, to synthesize these two extreme values, cult and these are cross-cultural values, is that they say that instead of competing for sales, why don't we say that? We compete about what you have learned from the customer this quarter. Anyone can come out and tell us what you have learned from the customer. And the panel will vote on the lessons learned. The group that has the highest score on the lessons learned from the customer will win the competition. So these kinds of synthesis, cultural competence, joins the individualism and the communitarianism approach in creating a strategy that has a X and Y chromosome in its, in its helix. So in every winning, winning contest, there is collab competition and there is, and there is uh, cooperation. Same thing as uh, 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 Motorola does that also in their total customers uh, satisfaction competition. We think more specifically in the, East, in the West and in the East, they think more diffusely. Forecasting, for example, forecasting is a way of forcing ourselves to converge very quickly, right? And scenario planning uh, is to think about various scenario, much a divergent approach, much more widely. So the specific <coughs> culture tend to think about the text more, and the more diffuse culture think to think about the context a little bit more. You see? So we tend to polarize ourselves. But good, but it doesn't mean that if you're Oriental, you tend to, you, you, don't, you don't think about text. And if you are Western person, if you're American, you don't think about context at all. We're not saying that. We're saying that a successful person has 
this cross cultural competence of the specific values as well as the diffuse values, the time to, to diverge and the time to converge. So the, if you join these two together, you are a cross cultural person, is what we're trying to say. So, and, and we, think, we tend to end up doing this that in the West, we tend to think from ourselves individually, our inner self, and out. And, and for Chinese and Japanese and Korean, it was from outside in. What does that mean to the society? What does it mean to the corporation? What does it mean to the family? And then what does it mean to me? You see? These two cultures are coming from uh, different directions. But we're not saying, once inside out is once outside in. We're not, again, we're not saying which, which value is correct or the best. We're saying that we need both. Ah, this is an interesting question. <laughs> Let me just ask this question. We ask a group of Western and Eastern people that, how many of you would paint your boss's home for him over the weekend, <laughs> July 4th weekend? <laughs> this is interesting. How many of you would volunteer to paint your boss's home uh, over the weekend, July 4th weekend? <laughs> Anybody could want to express that? <laughs> This is the results. Whoa, again, the Scandinavians, right? And the Europeans, and, so, and the English speaking people say, no, we will not paint your boss's house. Now, this, this, for this particular question, the French people came out to be quite on the top. They say, no, 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 no. But look at China. Look at Singapore. Singapore, look at China. We're talking about China today. Look at China. A lot of them, Think about outside in first. Why? Because they, they are a bit more diffuse. They think that, okay, in the, in the East we tend to think that, in the West we tend to think that, hey, wait a minute, I have a contract with the company. And there's a contract between me and the company and the work that I do, I do for the company. I don't have a contract with my boss for painting his house. It's just from Monday to Friday or whatever it takes to finish my work. But painting his house is outside the contract. So we think very specifically. But wait a minute now. In China, in the East, people don't think that way. They say that, wait a minute now. He says that my boss is the one who writes my appraisal at the end of the, of the, of the day. And he takes care of my well-being here. He can make me really miserable. And my livelihood depends on him. So if, if he needs a little help, what is wrong? for me to sacrifice one weekend and go help him paint the house. So who's right, who's wrong? It's like, that, it's like the, uh, the, the accident, the guy who drove the car and, and hit, you know, hit this pedestrian. So the Americans tell the, the Chinese and the Japanese that, you know, we cannot be friends with you because you are a bunch of idiots who don't obey laws, who will lie to the court of law. And then the Chinese and the Japanese turn around and say, we can't be friends with you Americans because you guys don't you guys betray your friends after 30 years. You betray our friendship. So who is right and who is wrong? So we all have different values, you see. And our values are different. There are differences. They're not right and wrong sometimes. Now, we take this diffuse and specific concept, we turn them into strategy. We look at IKEA, for example. IKEA produced specific parts. Furniture in a CKD, in a knockdown form, all right? And then uh, they, they have also a very diffuse, these are specific parts, specific furniture. They have a more sophisticated Swedish design for a setting, uh, uh, like a, a lounge set, and they display them in a diffuse, uh, in a very uh, holistic, specific pieces within diffuse holes. They take all these pieces and they put them into a living room setting. We walk into their display. Wow, you were going to buy a piece of, you were just going to buy a table, a dining table. You're not going back again to buy the chairs. You're not going back to buy the table lamps. You're not going for the whole entire system. Ah, you see, that's where cross-cultural competence, thinking about diffuse or specific, when you join them into a circle and they become a strategy innovation. So nobody could 
my it has been around for a long time. I worked for Electrolux AB for many, many years. It's a Scandinavian company. But you know what? Up to today, nobody has been able to duplicate IKEA. Why? When you have a single dimensional strategy, it's very easy to duplicate. Just low cost, easy to duplicate. If you're just a search company, period, you know what? Might be quite easy to duplicate too. If you're a search company as well as a portal, you develop deep competence in your search uh, uh, technology. And as you go into it deeper and deeper, you might find capabilities that you can apply to enhance your portal business, your e-commerce. So this is a very interesting way to join cultural values into a holistic strategy and it's now two-dimensional strategy. Mass customization, we talked about Dell computer, is two-dimensional. Because if it's mass production, it's easy to copy. If it's customization at low volume, it's easier to copy. But when you have mass customization, look at HP, try to do that, fail. Look at Compaq, try to do that, fail. Lenovo's bottle of IBM, is, they're trying to do that too. I'm not sure they have any great success. Not yet, at least. It's very difficult to duplicate. If you are able to come up with these kinds of strategy, joining two different dilemmas, two paradoxes. And it's the same as, you know, you guys go out and do planning, the retreat, I don't know how you do it here, but some managers are so hooked on a design strategy, you know, you went away for a retreat, you say, oh, you know, at the end of the year, next year, this is how we're going to do it. Hey, minute you come back, minute you put your plan in writing, it becomes obsolete because the environment changes. Some people just react to emergent, emergent strategy. They keep reacting to the emergent strategy. They keep reacting to the competition. And then, you know what? At the end of the day, they forgot about their own vision. They forgot where they're heading to. So these two, again, are different value, cultural values. Put them together, you craft strategy, designing out of emerging success. So a good set of strategy is crossing culture, joining <coughs> these two dilemmas into a circle. So you have a planned strategy, and you always adjust a planned strategy using what is em emerging and eventually approaching your vision. Now, I think these are very motherhood for many of you who are very, very smart, uh, intelligent, but many of us today still cannot join these two values, and we are still we are, we are polarized. We are, we are drowned in, in this polarization. We can't get out of it. The next one is inner directed versus outer directed. Uh, again, if you look at the research, we find that people from the Oriental or the East, China in particular, at the bottom there, they don't believe that what happens to you is your own doing. Whereas in the, in the West, we believe that what happens to us is our own, own doing. They say, what happens to me is a lot of reasons. The society, the policy of the nation, you know, born into which family I didn't ask to, it's not my own doing. Whereas here we say, you know, live the American dream. You know, we don't care where you come from. Go out and live the dream. You could be a Russian immigrant, but you can build Googles. Some example of Singapore <laughs> using... Um, sorry, go back to this, inner and outer directed. Singapore has inner, uses inner outer directed cultural competence very well. It, first of all, it has an inner directed... Singapore is a country where, you know, Google is, I'm sure you are, uh, you, know, you have people traveling in that region a lot. We have graduates working here too. Uh, uh, Randif and uh, Ming. So, but Singapore is one country where they, it is small, four million people, no natural resources. So it decides for itself, in a directed league, what kinds of industry it wants to build and excel in with high value add uh, contribution. And then it sources it from, it brings in the type of industry that they, they, they feel that they need from foreign, uh, from, from, from across the world. And then it, then it has an outer directed policy where it produces its own engineers and it, Singapore uses a lot of foreign talents. A lot of foreign talents. You see a lot of foreigners working in Singapore. Uh, very qualified foreign talent. And it has the most liberal policy to encourage foreigners with deep technical competence or managerial competence to work there. It's an outer-directed uh, philosophy. 
But a lot of the less developed countries are trapped. They are only interdirected. They are only focused this way. So they cannot transform the country. But Singapore does it very well. It's, it's an intelligent island. Uh, very well wired. I wouldn't talk about that one. Okay, then the next one is uh, achieve versus subscribe in the interest of time. Uh, achieve versus subscribe. <coughs> uh, again, we talked about that one. Uh, we asked this question again. Uh, most Americans and English speaking Anglo Saxon disagree with acting as really suits you, right? But in the Orient, people act in a job as though it, is, it suits them, you know, but, people, but the society has scribed them the stature. Whether it suits you or not, I, this is the, I'm in the right place in the right time, I'm going to assume it. So, <laughs> so they agree with that. And the last one is uh, uh, sequence versus uh, uh, synchronized time. And this is interesting. Let's look at this. We ask, we ask uh, people of different culture about time. This is how they look at time. Americans, we look at the past as the past. All right? Uh, now and the future is slightly intertwined. But let's focus on the future. That is why a lot of people in the Orient cannot understand why America will go back and build and implement the Marshall Plan and help Japan rebuild after Japan attempted to bomb China, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. And, and lately they found that the shrine that the Japanese Prime Minister was, was visiting in, included some of the generals who were mastermind of the bombing of the Pearl Harbor. But you know what? In America, we tend to say that the past is the past. Forget that. Let's, let's, let's focus on the future. The Japanese say, oh, wait a minute now. The, the Japanese and the Chinese is the same. The past and the current and the future are all intertwined. That's why China and Japan are quarreling about, about the Second World War, because Jap the Japanese have not clarified the situation. Clearly, to the Chinese, at least they have not. And history is not written properly. So, so you wonder, so Americans are scratching their head. Why is it that you guys can't get over this thing? Say, wait a minute, because this is how we think about time. It's related. Uh, the UK, think about, it overlaps a little bit. Maybe this is because of imperialism. I don't know, colonialization. It overlaps a little bit. The Germans, the, the French tend to relate those three space concepts. And look at this one. I like this one. <laughs> this is the Spanish thing. They're the future. Let's not worry about that too much. It's, it's not related. <laughs> but it's, it is when we, and it's when we synchronize and it's when we synthesize, means joining or reconcile time as a linear concept of sequ sequential timing and a synchrony where we use just in time, just in time, a flexible manufacturing, you know, is this cultural synthesis of these two values. So we take synchronized time. All right, and we take sequential time, and we put them together. We do small volume, flexible manufacturing. So what we're saying up to now is very much that cultural values are different. East and West, from day one, tend to think differently because of our, society, our cultural background, and we have a problem. If we insist that we are right and others are wrong, this world cannot function. But if we can think about these two values, which are, uh, there's a tension in between and there's a dilemma, we call them as dilemma like reconciliation. If we can join them together in these steps and make them into, since this is our string, all right, since this is our string, it's like a string you pull. If you pull it, <laughs> it will break. Okay, these are, there are two polarized values. Why don't we just make them into a cultural space? And then we can join them into a circle. Then we can twist them and then we can spiral them. We can use exceptions, which is particularism, to test the rule or keep refining the rules. And the rule is the West, the exception is the East. If we can use exceptions to keep refining the rules, the rules will get better and better and better and better. And that will be a cross-cultural, that will be a bicultural competence uh, 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 manifestation. 
In other words, we have just reconciled the dilemma. So we could use that for strategy, and we can also use that for innovation. Innovation is also, um, why, why should uh, people who cross cultures be interested in innovation and creativity? There's some reasons here. I'll run through very quickly. Creativity unifies diverse ideas and perspectives. I don't have to say that because you're all, you're, you're involved in, in, in innovation and creativity all the time. What you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to join two thoughts, two variables, a thought matrix that are seemingly unrelated. You know, you, you don't see any relationship between these two variables. But when you join them, whoo, all of a sudden it creates, it creates a splash and it creates a significant meaning. Now you have a relationship. Now you have an innovation. So, so people who cross cultures are also involved in innovation. And therefore innovation occurs in, in very diverse culture. San Francisco is a big is a ex example of, of this innovation effort where you have a lot of diverse culture. Immigrants, foreigners, strangers. Uh, I was just visiting my daughter who just graduated from the entrepreneurship program that, that uh, 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 Rand took in Singapore, and she's an industrial designer. She studied in the University of Washington, and then she went to China to study Mandarin for one year in Peking University, and went to Nanyang to take this uh, technology entrepreneurship innovation program. And I went to visit her at the IDEO. She's, she's just, her first job is at I, IDEO, it's, and they have an office in San Francisco by the bay, by the, sorry, by the pier. It's very interesting. The, 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 the team that she has, she's just flew off to New York. This is her second week to do a project, an innovation project. Four of them, herself, American, uh, she's American too, but herself, an Anglo person, a, pers a, a designer from Dutch, from Holland, and another person from Taiwan, uh, American Chinese from Taiwan. Four of them, very diverse culture, and they all have four different expertise. They, they are not all computer engineers or designers. Very, one is an anthropolo uh, anthropo anthropology major. Very interesting uh, background. So diversity is important. Diversity uh, creates creativity. Diversity, diversity nurtures creativity, but diversity without inclusion is no use. You guys, you, you're a diverse culture, but you don't include people, then it's not in the decision making. But it can also be very scary. Look at this diversity. It can be over, also very scary because, you know, people don't look alike. You have to get used to it. You know, it's a very scary uh, 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 situation. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. And this, again, this is a cultural, uh, these are dilemma reconciliation uh, methods of thinking about things. You've got unity, diversity, association, remoteness, and now we use multidisciplinary approach to create a new uh, strategy, a new uh, discovery, a new creativity. So we are constantly in, in innovative work. Uh, trying to reconcile between these two values, rock, will, put order, disorder, fixed dynamics, vertical, lateral, conscious, and unconsciousness. These are the two extremes that we're constantly trying to uh, deal with. And creativity is the shock of recognition. We recognize all of a sudden that they are all components, they're all elements uh, that could be recombined to create a very interesting relationship, a very interesting synthesis. And this particular slide talked about creativity and it starts from arts and then ended up in science and back in arts again because I think creativity is, you gotta have the vision and the leadership. These are social sciences and arts first. Think about certain ideas and then you use technology and then come back again. You have to use your leadership and your coaching and mentoring and to make it happen and just help customers solve problems. Okay, now very quickly, I want to make a very simple and very quick uh, hypothesis. What I have said about, talked about earlier, to summarize it, the East and West is quite different, but in order for us to be successful, we can, we don't have to compromise. We can join them together, right? We join them together, we solve, we reconcile the dilemma, we can create two-dimensional strategy out of it. So we don't have to try to change the Chinese in China, and they don't have to try and change us here in America. But we need to appreciate each other's cultural differences. We need to design a model 
like the, like the spiral, to come together to use each other's strength back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to synthesize. Now, <laughs> there's a lot of, of conjecture out there whether China will con growth will continue or not. I think that's very important for you. Uh, and and uh, Dr. Charles Hampton Turner and I made a presentation at Xiamen University in China in March. And our hypothesis is that China's uh, economic growth will continue. And there are eight reasons why we say so, and I will not go through every one of those. But uh, just very briefly, um, education is the key in China. And they continue to, I was just with the education minister in two weeks ago in Beijing, his office. He continues to tell me how important education is. And they're going to the 80% of the budget in China is going to be spent in the village to bring the basic education up to 10 year level. 80%. So they're going to privatize a lot of the university. They're going to promote 100 universities. The rest of them is going to be merged and whatnot. But each year, there are 150,000 Chinese people go outside to study graduate school, undergraduate graduate school. That's about close to uh, 10 to 12,000 PhDs studying PhD program across the world. They're coming back. 90% of them are coming back to China to contribute. So education is going to continue, and therefore China's, Chinese uh, advance and e economy was sustained because of the pro-education approach. Now, the, this point number two is important. Change and continuity, again, this is two cultural values, conflict. In the, change is an idealism. Continuity is, it, it is practical, it's now. It is conservative, conservatism, it is it's pragmatism. But in China, they use these two values together to reconcile. Therefore, they did not dismantle the entire system plan economy. They introduced what they call, they call an open door policy and a market driven economy. They use the market driven economy, the invisible hand, to slowly dislodge the inefficiency of the plan economy. So there is a continuity there. Whereas the Soviet Union dis dis dismantled everything and everything went bust. There's no more Soviet Union. So the Chinese people have an inherent ability to reconcile dilemmas. They believe that for a change to succeed, you must have some level of continuity. The third hypothesis that we say is that, yes, China has been weak, has been quite weak in technology in the last couple of hundred years because of the disruption, uh, political turmoil and the foreign domination and whatnot. But if you go back and look at the history, the Chinese people invented a lot of things, paper printing, you know, China, you know, ceramic, uh, binary, binary numbers, uh, Compass, you name it. So, so, and 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 if you go and visit some of the top universities, Tsinghua and Beida and Zhejiang University, who are the, the students are very very strong in ma mathematics and physics. Sciences are very good. The community communitarian culture is very important now. For China to sustain, it can order massive effort and mobilize the people to do something for the common good. So this is going to help China sustain. Um, and also, uh, point number seven, I want to talk about point number seven is that the Chinese people believe in playing the infinite game rather than a finite game. I want to talk about that a little bit in my conclusion, okay? <coughs> so these hypotheses that we set, okay, concludes that our, our thesis that we think that China's growth will continue to sustain rather than, than disrupt it because it has an internal mechanism to fuel the growth of the economy. Now, I want to go on and talk about one of the key Chinese attributes, one of the key Chinese mentality is to play the finite game, not, not the infinite, to play the infinite game and not the finite game. And what do I mean by that? The infinite games, as defined by James Kirst, is that an infinite game are subtle, uh, uh, market-driven economies with purposeful leadership in the later stage of development. The finite game has a fixed rule. It's a win-lose situation. The infinite game changes rule by agreement. Uh, who wins the short uh, contest is less important than who improves the mastery of the game in the, long, in the long term. So the finite game as we like to play in the West many a times is the purpose is to win. 
improves through fitness, surviving, winners exclude losers, winners take all, aims are identical, relatively simple, rules are fixed in advance, which is very different in China. Rules, yes, we talked about rules in advance, but they change as the situation emerges. Con yes, we have a contract. You know why people don't like to use contract in China? Because they shake of hands, because they believe in the word and the pride and the, and, and the trust. It's the reason why they don't like to put this in writing culturally is because they don't like to play a finite game where rules are fixed in advance. If I promise to buy a barrel of oil, a million barrel of oil from you in the next three years at $50, I expect you to allow me to break the, law, the rules, to break the, the contract because oil prices have gone through the ceiling. I'm not going to be able to supply you at $50 anymore because if I did, I'll go broke. So, so don't come sue me because if you start doing that, we won't do business with you. So the East believed, the Chinese believe in the infinite game. We don't, we don't really want to fix the rules in advance. We want to play as we go. Um, and we don't want to, uh, just a short-term uh, decision, you know. Uh, so the infinite game is to improve the game, improve the game through evolving. Winners teach losers to play better. If you win, you teach losers to play, uh, 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 how to play the game better. Winning, widely shared, aims are diverse, relative, complex. Rules are changed by agreement. Rules resembles grammar of original utterance, grow new markets, and be long-term in your thinking. Now, this is very important. The companies that did well in China in the last 10, 15 years since the open door policy are like Coca-Cola, Volkswagen, Audi, uh, uh, AIG, these are the companies that have winners teach losers play better, which took in Chinese scholars back in the 1800s. They are training all the legislator, they are training the law, the, 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 uh, uh, the, attor the top attorneys, the judges, the legislator. And Yale University, in, ex in return, was, it was given the right to purchase A-class shares in China. Nobody is allowed to do that. You can buy B-class B, B stocks in China for foreigners. But Yale University is given the right. So winners teach loser. Coca-Cola, as I said earlier, right, built the bottling factory and gave it to the Chinese, and sold it to the Chinese, and said, OK, this is how you build a world-class factory. So they teach the loser. But in return, the Chinese gave them Right, AIG bought a lot of, of uh, paintings and national treasures that were stolen by the West during the Boxing Revolution and now being auctioned across the world. They bought them and they returned it to the Chinese. They put it in the museum and said, this is, belongs to China. In return, the Chinese say, wow, you love, you love us, you love our culture, you love our society. And we want to be friends with you, we want to do business with you forever. That is the way to do business in China, and that's the way you cross culture, and that's the way you become bicultural. So it is important for you to succeed in the world with a duality of strategy. Now let me conclude by saying that what I'm saying now is like the traffic light. These are the, the last few slides. If you look at the traffic light, there are two major, like, uh, two major colors, right? The red and the green. And the amber is just the warning that it was going to switch. So which, which color is better? Which do you prefer? What, what do you prefer? Green. You prefer the green? OK. Why don't we have green lights all over? Bang! What happened to our traffic system? We're all going to crash into each other. We're going to die. So if you say you prefer the red, the whole city comes to a standstill. So one is the Western values, and one's the Eastern value. But how do you create a bicultural competence? How do you create value in this world where we can become like that painting, the, 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 the angel and the bat? So if it's red light, we crash. So the way we create value is for the green and the red lights to switch in sequence, right? So the green and red, 
and green and red and the traffic flows automatically. You can obviously synchronize the timing. But green signals one type of cultural values, red signal another type. Green signal mass customiza uh, customization, red signals uh, uh, mass production, low cost. But it is in the switching of these two values where it creates, sorry, these two lights, colors, that it creates true value for all of us. But if each of us insists that our value is the best and the rest of us must follow us, that's where we have a traffic crash or a, a traffic congestion situation. So I want to stop there by uh, saying that <coughs> that America is blessed with multicultural people and but knowing how to speak one's language doesn't make you doesn't provide you with a bicultural competence it is understanding these values these six dimensional values that controls the way we do things and it controls the way we think about strategy in business and controls the way that we we, we execute our, our, our plans in, in a global world so if we can come together and synthesize these dilemmas, it will create a much more sustainable strategy for you, for Googles, and will make a much better world for all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you have any questions, I would be glad to take a few. Yes? Breakable contracts. I mean, that's, uh, that's extremely susceptible to a defector, right? You gave us some examples of successes where AIG, you know, and Coke. It seems to me there would be many, many more cases of failure where a company made an overture and then they allowed a contract violation and then there was never any repayment on the other side. And, and I, I see going forward, I don't see that as as a sustainable option because. You know, people who honor contracts. I mean, eventually it must converge. It seems like it must converge on our system. Please. Yes. Well, uh, I think that there are several ways to solve this. Obviously, the Chinese are also understanding that uh, more and more Chinese people returning from the U.S. and from the rest of the world are innovating now. As they are innovating, they are going to the government and say that we're spending all this money creating this IP. <laughs> we want the government to protect us. Because if you don't protect our IP, we will not innovate. So the pressure, because of the red and the green light coming together, they are building internal pressure for China itself to rise to the occasion and say, hey, you know what? Intellectual property, protecting intellectual property is not only good for Microsoft, it's also good for our own in innovators, for our own company. And we, we must do that. If not, nobody will invest. So it is us teaching them and they teaching us. Let me give you a case. This is a case where, where Charles Hampton Turner's book was translated in Korea by Samsung without permission. So they were going to Samsung to give a talk and all of a sudden Samsung handed them this book with this Korean translation and it was circulated all, all over this, the, the, the corporate, uh, corporate people. So, so the question was asked, uh, did you, did you talk to the publisher? about translating this book? He says, what? What publisher? No, we just translated into Korean. But that's a violation of law. So what do we do? Sue them? No, they didn't do that. These are cross-cultural people. They say, wait a minute now. How much does it cost for you to do translation? Oh, it costs 50,000 US. Whoa, OK. Mm -hmm. So they sat down. And you know what? They negotiated a way out. They said, OK, you have a publishing house in a Samsung group of companies. Why don't we make a deal? It will cost us. $50,000 to get somebody to translate my book in Korea. You publish the book for us, and we have the rights to sell it all over Korea. They got, they got a very smart way out of this thing. First of all, they didn't have to spend $50,000 to do the translation. They did not embarrass the Korean. The Korean were embarrassed that they forgot to, to seek approval from them first, and then the Koreans ended up being their distributor for the book, and they got their way out of this thing. So, uh, Again, I'm not saying that uh, having a contract is the wrong thing to do. But I'm saying that as you go into China, understand these differences. And there are people who, who are willing to work with them on these differences until, until they themselves learn what is a better way of doing things. But if you're not willing to do that, then you'll be letting 
much later and the barrier of entry will be much higher. So Google is also running some problems in China, for example, freedom of speech, blocking certain news and whatnot, website. Why is it? You gotta understand because it's a communitarian society and harmony, social harmony is the biggest thing, not democracy. Now you can say that it's wrong, but you know what? They have billions of people to feed and they are worried about another term, another cultural revolution, another, another foreign invasion. But that's the culture, we can't change them. So they place much higher values on the social harmony and therefore they want to control these things. But we're not trying to defend them. We're trying to say, please understand. If you don't understand, it's going to be very difficult for you to make do business there. And, and the other alternative is to opt out. Don't play the game. But can you not play the game? There are people who toughed it out and eventually excel and do well. Okay? Sorry, I probably didn't answer your question fully. But do you think your question is legitimate? Okay? Any, any more questions? All right. If not, uh, thank you very much for coming this afternoon to share with us uh, on the issue of culture competence. Thank you.